In the name of God, the most merciful, the most compassionate. Gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It is a, a great honor and privilege to welcome His Excellency Dr. Muhammad Ashraf Ghani, President of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan. I would also like to extend a warm welcome to the senior delegation accompanying His Excellency as well as to the members of the Afghan Republic, Republic negotiation team who have been working hard here in Doha for the last four weeks. A warm welcome also to the many distinguished members of the diplomatic community in Doha, as well as to the officials from various Qatari institutions who are in attendance here today. Out of respect to our guests, today we shall uh, conduct our session in English with simultaneous translation available in Arabic. So please, if you need translation, the headsets are available and my colleagues will be able to hand you one. As you can see, the COVID-19 pandemic has restricted us to only 150 people in a room where we usually would seat around 500. However, I am grateful to Al Arabi TV and Al Jazeera, who will be supporting us by broadcasting the lecture online in addition to the uh, streaming uh, on our own platforms. We have just uh, over an hour today with His uh, Excellency, where he will speak for about 20 minutes or so and then it will be followed by a question and answer session. For those following us online, please leave any questions you may have on Twitter or Facebook, and again, my colleagues will pass them on to me and I will address, him, address them to His Excellency. I am extremely grateful that President Ghani is visiting us during such a critical time in the history of the region and in the history of Afghanistan as the intra-Afghan negotiations are taking place here in Doha. That he has found the time during his short and very busy trip to deliver a lecture at our academic institution underlines his considerable commitment to knowledge, higher education, and scholarship. The Center for Conflict and Humanitarian Studies is committed to research and knowledge production to better understand the humanitarian and conflict response. We also believe that academia has a lot to offer in terms of support to real life efforts to making peace. In fact, ever since our establishment in 2016, we have engaged in supporting various track two initiatives focused on facilitating peace in a number of contexts, including Afghanistan. Last year, we focused our efforts on holding intra-Afghan dialogue in Doha here. And whilst our first attempt was unsuccessful, our second attempt in July 2019 brought together Afghan officials and civil society leaders in their individual capacities to meet face to face with the Taliban for the first time, which paved the way for further progress. Today, we welcome President Rani not just as a distinguished head of state who has, made, uh, who has left and made a mark on the global stage, but also as a fellow academic at heart. One fact that not many people uh, would know about His Excellency is that he held a number of prestigious positions in academia, teaching anthropology and political science at various leading universities in the United States, including John Hopkins and the University of California, Berkeley. Those amongst us that have an interest in studying post-conflict reconstruction would have first encountered President Rani as the leading voice that believed in the importance of the state for sustaining reconstruction and development and for protecting the interests of everyone in societies undergoing the transition from war to peace. His book, which I hold with me here, uh, Fixing Failed States, A Framework for Rebuilding a Fractured World, which was published in 2008, quickly became the mandatory reading for my postgraduate students in post-war recovery studies at the University of York, 
some of whom are in the audience today amongst the senior members of the Afghan delegation, and I here welcome Your Excellency Atmar. At the time of its publication, the concept of a strong state had really fallen out of fashion in the global aid industry. And President Rani, through his scholarship, has single-handedly, more than any other scholar that I have come across, placed the state back to the center of analysis in addressing conflict, development, and fragility. The central argument of his book is that a shared responsibility for state building should lie in a collaborative relationship between national governments, their citizens, and the international community. It offered a powerful message back in 2008 that resonates ever, ever more strongly in 2020, when the world finds itself faced with the fragmentation and erosion of multilateral cooperation and, a, and sliding towards more and more populist nationalism. President Ghani has done much to stabilize and rebuild Afghanistan during his long and distinguished career. Between 2002 and 2004, he served as Minister of Finance, playing a major leadership role at a critical time in Afghanistan's post-conflict transition. From 2004 until 2008, President Ghani also served as the Chancellor of Kabul University, where under his successful leadership, he was able to turn the university back into the leading national academic institution in Afghanistan. In 2005, he founded the Institute for State Effectiveness, which has done profound work across the world to promote more responsive and accountable governance. In September 2014, His Excellency Dr. Ghani was elected to office and he was re-elected for a second term in September 2019. In his time in office, President Rani has presided over the task of rebuilding his country whilst facing political, economic, and security challenges at the, at the national, regional, and international levels. His Excellency would remember that we have actually met in the past in, when he was the Minister of, uh, of Finance and uh, I was uh, a researcher, and those of us who knew Afghanistan from those days can clearly see the remarkable progress that has been made and will fully understand the strength of the desire to protect those gains. In particular, history will remember kindly his commitment to the education of millions of Afghan boys and girls, and his role in lifting millions out of poverty while respecting their rights and more important dignity. Finally, I would like to take the opportunity once more to thank you all for joining us at such short notice and for responsibly adhering to social distancing rules. We usually would host a reception to thank our speaker and welcome you all, but unfortunately under the current circumstances, we simply are not allowed to do so. But I hope there will be other opportunities to welcome you all in the future. Without further ado, I will now give the floor to His Excellency President Mohammad Ashraf Ghani. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. It's, it's great to be back in an academic setting. So I'd like to thank you, all your colleagues, the chairman, and all the faculty members and the students for this opportunity. I'd like to thank my colleagues, especially Vice President Saleh and our other colleagues, the members of the Afghan Peace Delegation who have been doing a heroic job uh, and all uh, those present. I'm going to focus on peace building. You live in peace, 
So maybe you don't have the appreciation of what peace means. Uh, do you want to switch me back? Oh, all right. Oh, I'm sorry. OK. Thank you. Peace is foundational capital. What do I mean by that? Let me tell you a story. In 1977, it was Eve. My wife and I thought, what should we do? We got on a plane and went to Badakhshan province and then flew to the remote district of Shirnan. We walked for a week. We didn't know a single person in the district, but they allowed us to sleep on their roofs and they gave us hospitality and made us welcome. Another day, we got on a, in a car and drove through five provinces, Ghazni, Maidan Wardak, Ghazni, Paktika, Paktia, Host, and Logar, and arrived back in the middle of midnight. At that time, freedom of movement for a two 27-year-olds was taken for granted. Because of this, peace is economic, we lost an estimated $240 billion between 1978 and 2002 as a result of the war. The cost of what we've paid since 2002 has not been calculated. It's human. Millions of us have became refugees. 10 million of us have returned back. Four million of us during the last five years. Can you understand the human cost of displacement? The lack of continuity. It's natural capital. The destruction of our irrigation system during those periods, each time we built a bridge, particularly a long one, we celebrated. Each time we built a paved road or connected places to electricity, it was a national celebration. Can you imagine the destruction inflicted on the road between Kabul and Kandar that was built at the cost of more than uh, $400 million? It's political because peace gives you a horizon to think through and not think about tomorrow. Peace removes turmoil and uncertainty out of the equation, and it's social because it allows for freedom of interactions across the board. So in this regard, my first proposal to you, because you're leading this institute, is that the advantage of peace in the cost of war is not sufficiently theorized and not sufficiently thought through still. We think that war is a condition that you grow used to. No, you don't. My life, my, my work begins usually at 4.30 or 5. Dr. Moheb, our national security advisor, sent me the worst thing, uh, which is the, the figure of casualties. And I need to have that hour to absorb the cost. Every Afghan life plans, horizons, thinking is disrupted by the cost of conflict. When you live with, con with conflict for, over, for around 40 years, you don't get used to it, you don't accept it, you want to overcome it. So peacemaking, what is peacemaking? Peacemaking is the art and discipline of statecraft. You need to wish it. What do we have at this moment? First, we have the national will for peace. Our lawyer Jirga, the our grand council, for over 3,000 men and women, met 
It was convened in four days. It arrived at a solution to a problem that 50 meetings at the head of state level could not solve. Our men and women decided to opt morally provide the basis for releasing 400 people that it killed. Our closest people, among them 40 of the largest drug dealers in the world that posed a threat, but our people had the wisdom to solve what could not be solved legally. So the will for peace, the people of Afghanistan, the government of Afghanistan, have passed this test in flying colors, and I'd like to thank the men and the women and men in the Afghan peace delegation that are representing this collective will and are guided by our constitution and the resolutions of our Lord Jirgu. The second issue is peace is guided by a notion of the end state. What is that end state? A sovereign, united, democratic Afghanistan at peace with itself in the world. And because this proposition is now strongly backed by the international community in the region, there is an alignment as to the type of peace that we desire. Three, there is a strong regional consensus on a stable Afghanistan. And in Afghanistan, that would once again, I'll articulate further down, be an Asian roundabout and a platform for regional and global cooperation. And let me thank His Highness the Amir of Qatar and the government of Qatar. Now we have a host for peace negotiations and a host that is committed to making sure that an enduring peace takes place. I'd like to thank His Highness for the exceptional hospitality, but particularly for assuring the people of Afghanistan that Qatar will be a force for peace, cooperation, and stability. And we also have a group of countries that are friends of peace, that are present, that are working with our delegation and working with our people. Fifth, we have a negotiating team that is authority and the mandate of the people of Afghanistan. This is the first team, negotiating team, that is not going to be micromanaged. We trust them. Our women are incredibly strong. Our men are incredibly dedicated. I'd like everybody to have an applause for them. And at the center of the government, I'm pleased to say it's an exceptional unity of thought and action. Vice President Saleh, Minister Atma, Dr. Mohib, and other colleagues, a very big thank you. Each of us can finish each other's sentences. Each of us represent a unified stand. What's peace building? I'm not getting into the details of peacemaking, because if I get into that detail, I'll be second guessing them. They have my total backing. When they encounter a problem, I learned to my great delight yesterday, they solve it in two hours. When our interlocutors, the Taliban, encounter a problem, it takes them two days to two weeks to get an answer. More power to you, and I hope they acquire more delegation so we can move the process forward. But I'd like to focus on peace building. What's peace building? The discipline of design, alignment, and implementation. We are cursed by, an, and I say this with humility, by an inheritance of a culture of planning. In planning, you think you know what the answer is. You don't think through how to tailor, how to stitch solutions, how to. In planning, everything is prejudged. Well, this country doesn't have capacity. This country has the capacity. 
Well, what's the meaning of capacity? A lot of judgments are made from one way of looking. My submission to you today is we need to change our perspective. And hence, I'm presenting a different Afghanistan to you. Not the Afghanistan that bleeds every day, but an Afghanistan that dreams every day. An Afghanistan with a vision. So in terms of design thinking, you take a problem to solve it. And one of the fundamental questions of design thinking in the peace process, who's the victor of peace? The people of Afghanistan. War has no victors. And the biggest winners of peace are the people. Not just the living generations, particularly five of the elder generations that have gone through sheer hell, my generation, the succeeding generations, but the generations unborn. People, is, peace is for the people that come. So the weight of six generations in the, future, in the present, the weight of five generations in the future is in front of us. Therefore, we have to force solutions that overcome the problems. The word impossible should not exist in, in the peace building. We have to make the seeming impossible possible, and hence bringing that. Second is alignment. The question of alignment is simple. When you put a wall of uh, bricks, if it's twisted, we have a proverb. It's going to be twisted all the way. Alignment is about bringing state building, market building, peace building, and nation building together. You cannot operate in silos. The fundamental heritage, the bad heritage of, 21st, of 20th century is to think in silos. An engineer has to be an engineer, a social scientist has to be a social scientist, while the art of the 21st century is to work together. We have to make sure, because just to give you one example, as a result of peace, at least three to five million more Afghans are going to return to Afghanistan. How are they going to live? How are they going to work? 90% of our population, despite our efforts, live below, live below $2 a day. If we don't lift them out of need to a livelihood that they can think through, there will always be a reserve army of labor. So it's important to think through alignment in a clear manner, because alignment overcomes the problem of misallocation. Afghanistan has not suffered from shortage of resources. It has suffered from the misallocation of those resources. Our roads are one example. Some of the most expensive roads in the world built in the road with the lowest quality. So quality and quantity have to come together to enable us. And then it's the question of implementation. Academic discipline, and as you mentioned, I was honored uh, for 14 years. I was a teacher, and it's in my nature. And when I finish with this uh, job, I'll be again hoping to teach. I'm, my dream is to establish an institute in my ancestral village. And I've already gathered the land to make it possible, because sure. I would like to have an institute on Islamic studies our deepest binding form of human, political, and social capital. But implementation is to bring space and time together. Time meaning short term, medium term, and long term. We have suffered from the tyranny of short term. Everything is short term, immediate. You grab, you grasp, you accumulate, you fill your pockets. Part of the corruption that haunts us is because of short termism. If people thought that there was a long time horizon, they would think through more. So the short termism. The other part is, if you, didn't, if you don't own every inch of Afghanistan, you're not going to be able to make peace. I've had the honor to go 95 times since I'm president to the provinces. In my youth, I walked most of the country. 
I rode on horses in a back of trucks. During the transition, uh, which I had the honor of leading from say, international forces to security forces, I went to every single province of Afghanistan from three times to 10 times. We have deep history we need to acknowledge and be able to mobilize. So implementation is first and foremost about citizens. We Afghans have a great asset, sense of equality. We have never had caste. We really don't care about class because how can an average constitute a class? Uh, the money is short term, but we have deep senses of equality. When the vice president and I go and receive in our other colleagues, you know what people tell us? We have come to tell you our problems. Act on them, otherwise we will not come back. We are delighted that our people receive us and keep coming back. Because they know that we cannot solve every problem, but you have to solve their problem. And it's that sense of commitment that gives you the ability to make peace. But peace cannot be just taught at the national level. So regional connectivity is absolutely essential to peace building. The future of Afghanistan is tied to the region and to the world. And the other part is global cooperation. Our conflict is not a civil war. Let me repeat, this is not a civil war. If it were a civil war, it'd be over multiple times. It's a regional war embedded in a global conflict, embedded in the fifth wave of terrorism, in a form of warfare between networks and states that's not unusual but unprecedented because now virtual networks and social networks coincide. And of course, you and your colleagues. So given this, what is it that makes me optimistic? Our capitals and our capabilities. So let me highlight some of our capitals and then some of our capabilities. And then return back to peace building. First, we are an immense beneficiary of what happened a billion years ago. Our geology. Our geology is worth one trillion dollars at least. We are the Mandelieu table. Just take rare earth. 14 of the uh, 18 elements of, of rare earth exist in Afghanistan. We are called the Saudi Arabia of lithium, mm -hmm. the largest unexplored, undeveloped iron mine, etc. So there's this immense natural wealth that the collision of two continents produced that give us the Indo Kush Mountains and the unity of the country. And then Kabul was a lake separate from the subcontinent, its collision give us the largest copper mine. 90 copper mines exist between Kabul and Logar province alone. This is an incredible. The other part of this, unlike Iraq and other countries, Allah has been enormously kind to Afghanistan. Our natural resources are extremely even-handedly uh, distributed. And furthermore, the 10 poorest province of the country have some of the richest resources of the country in terms of its geology. This is made for national unity. In other countries, a mountain divides. In Afghanistan, Hindu Kush unites. Every valley of it is a valley of connection. Second is our geography. Iqbal, the poet laureate of Pakistan, put it best. Asia is but a body of water and earth, the heart of which is the Afghan nation. From its accord, the accord of Asia, from its discord, the discord of Asia. For 200 years, our location has been a disadvantage. Today, the largest single transformation in the history of humankind is the integration of the Asian continent into an Asian continental economy. Afghanistan is right smack in the middle of it. 
we are the shortest route between Central Asia and East Asia, West Asia, and South Asia. If our geology is worth a trillion, in my judgment, in the next 100 years, our location is going to be multiple trillions of dollars. Infrastructure now is going to unite it and bring it together. Third is our ecology. Simple fa uh, factors. Sun, wind, water. Sun. Potential of 220,000 megawatts of power from sun. Wind. Potential of 75,000 megawatts of power from wind. Water. Besides the life-sustaining qualities, five rivers, every one of our neighbors depends on our water. But more important, equally important, 23,000 megawatts of, of uh, hydrothermal. When you put the ecology, and again, I'd love to be able to be your guide as a tourist guide to Afghanistan of the future. This is some of the most beautiful location, ranging from 300 meters to 7,700 meters. Mm -hmm. Every ecological possibility, uh, except Mediterranean, is there. It, God has blessed us. Human beings have to make sure that the future generations and our friends can take them. The other part of this, is culture. We have been a center of civilizations for 2000, over 2,500 years. The Bronze Age was probably invented in Afghanistan. Our gold collection from that period after Tut is one of the largest. We've known states for over 2,500 years. And every province of Afghanistan or every region of Afghanistan has the distinction of having been the center of an empire. A civilization, interactive. Our Buddhist, our Greek, our Hindu, but the most binding part of our culture is our Islamic belief. It's a 99.99% .99 Muslim country. Islam unites us, the networks of Islamic discourse and practice, and for the record, we have the most Islamic constitution in the world, Article 1, 2, and 3. The character of state, not just society, is Islam. The other part of the culture is equally important and needs a mention. There is not a single linguistic community in Afghanistan that does not have a deep culture of conflict resolution. In 2018, we we and the Taliban agreed to a ceasefire. You know, every single one of us was jumping into that unknown. But you know what that taught me? Because in the social sciences, this is the closest that you can get to a controlled comparative experiment. Not one Talib was molested, insulted, humiliated, or fired upon. Instead, the people of Afghanistan, particularly the women of Afghanistan, engage them in a conversation. It shows an immense capacity to overcome the past and move forward towards the future. As a society that has that type of deep reservoir, these are people who literally, a week before, were being killed. I remember a young woman. Her name is Qudsia. She had memorized half the Quran and was in the process of completing. She was blown up to smithereens, just going, and she was the sole earner of bread for her family. But her family, again, embraced the ceasefire, as did everybody else. This is a deep reservoir of culture that needs to be utilized because peacemaking is not just at the grand level of signing an agreement, it's being able to live together again. And without that deep reservoir, it becomes different. Let me quickly go to some of the capabilities. We have 
one of the youngest populations in one of the oldest countries in Arabia. 75% of our people are below 30. Imagine, most of these people didn't experience what the five year of ruling of the Taliban was. And the Taliban need to understand this generation. It's global in outlook. It's future oriented. And like every generation, uh, from Lermontov onwards, the fathers and sons have different perceptions. And this generation is grown with their mothers. They have not just grown uh, in tents under the command of their fathers or in madrasas. That is an all-male institution. The fundamental nature of this gener generation needs to be understood. Yet, the tragedy is that we have six generations that are divided in experience. So their counterparts among the Taliban need to be thought through. The generational unity needs to be brought and everybody must think through. Pain is a common feature for all of us. We need to overcome this, but hope is the stronger factor. Our women. <laughs> Last year, we had the first all Afghan inclusive uh, grand jirga of the women of Afghanistan. Please understand two things. One, throughout their history, women have been heroines. In 1880, when an Afghan army, the first time in Asia, beat a British division, it was a woman who held the flag. Her name was Malala. She's the only woman for whom a medal has been printed, I hope. A lot of more uh, will be uh, minted. A second one is underway for our Queen Gawarsha. 600 years ago, she was the wealthiest woman in all of the world. Her awqaf, her endowments, are still the largest in Iran. Uh, so the sense what I'd like to bring to the attention of the world and our colleagues, the women of Afghanistan do not need someone to speak for them or write for them. They speak for themselves, they can represent themselves, and not only do they represent themselves, they represent the future generations. The poor. Our poor are situationally poor. They've not accept the culture of poverty does not exist in Afghanistan. We don't think that poverty is your destiny. We are entrepreneurial. It's a situation that we are put in. It's lack of assets, but it's not lack of will. And these three make the majority. All our quest is that our Taliban interlocutors address them, engage with them, understand them, and make peace with them. The market is another part of our strength. During COVID, and my congratulations again to the state of Qatar for managing this. Afghanistan has been extraordinarily lucky, not only that we managed COVID because we mobilized, and I'd like to th thank our friend Sheikh Tanu uh, for alerting us in early uh, February to what was coming. It was the first time that I heard uh, the word COVID economy. And Dr. Moy, thank you for, for that. Uh, we mobilized. But you know, there was not a single food deprivation event in Afghanistan. The private sector, Vice President Sali, thank you again for your enormous work on this. The supply chains and the value chains function throughout. There is, during, in 2001, uh, early 2001, uh, when Taliban were in power, <coughs> The exports of Afghanistan were about $10 million. Our export last year, for the first time, exceeded $1 billion. 
So understand now that the private sector is really functioning. They're entrepreneurs and they're world class uh, sets of capabilities. And last but not least, the state, as you kindly mentioned, is acquired capabilities. Not only COVID is a demonstration of this. Quickly, 150,000 international troops were in Afghanistan in 2011. Less than 10,000 international troops are in Afghanistan today. Since January 2015, our heroic security and national security and defense forces have not only been guarding our freedom, but ensuring global security. Their sacrifice, their commitment, Dr. Muhammad, thank you. Uh, that's the National Security Advisor and our other colleagues for ensuring this. Every single person in the Afghan National Security and Defense Forces is a volunteer. That's an indication of patriotism, a will. Do you think that they fight uh, in order to earn $200? No, because they believe. The 5,000 person graduate from Sandhurst in Kabul, it's called Sandhurst in the desert, the wrong abbreviation because Kabul is a lovely valley, <laughs> graduated. It's a different set of security forces. Equally, the capacity and infrastructure and others. Just two illustrations. We are providing, for the first time in our history, food packages to 4.5 million households. The national meal program that will cover 90% of the population of Afghanistan. And there was a flood in the province of Parwan that devastated the canal. Parwan is the cent one of the major centers of the grape industry, uh, resulting in raisins and, and, uh, and other things. And we would have lost the season and the livelihood of people. And people thought that the earliest this would be repaired would take 50 days. It was repaired in eight days. The state now has the capacity to design, to think, to act, because we have formed a unique partnership between a national construction company and 3,000 small and medium firms. But what is more important was the Lujirga. Do you think that a state that did not have will and capacity could convene a gathering of free Afghans, 3,300 of them, and think that it could get a result from them. Show me a society that can be convened nationally within four days and reach agreement to free, intense debate in three days. That is a degree of alignment. The issue which raises, our conflicts have never been about separation. There has not been a single group in Afghanistan that is raised the slogan of separating. Our conflicts have been a form of competition about be controlling the center. And that brings us to our key asset, the Republic. The Islamic Republic of Afghanistan is the framework within which all Afghans can see themselves. And in this regard, the Republic solves the problem that it haunted us in the past, succession. Succession now takes place through the free will of the people. And that, for the first time, power was handed without conflict from my predecessor to me. We have no blood relationship. That will of the people is fundamental to this. Because of this, let me conclude. The people in the government of Afghanistan are ready to overcome the past. We have the will, the capitals, the capabilities, the desire and readiness. This means 
that we must have, and I hope it's been demonstrated, of compassion, commitment, and courage. Compassion to understand each other, to acknowledge our common pains, but more importantly, compassion for the generations of our youth, our women, our children, and compassion for our common Islamic faith. Killing of one person in our holy religion is killing of humanity. This is a religion of peace. We need Um Salma and the Hudaybah peace. Courage. Courage because it takes jumping into the unknown. Conflict is very easy. It becomes automatic course. But we must be responsible for people who die because of our uh, orders. And commitment because the road is difficult. But we have to take the road. Let's travel. Second, we must put the citizens at the center. Peace in Afghanistan cannot be a peace of the elite. Peace in Afghanistan cannot be the peace of one group. Peace in Afghanistan cannot be the peace of factions. Peace must be the peace of the people. Because people are sovereign. Therefore, we must put the people first and do what our constitution, our religion, and our morals command us to do. We are servants. I pride myself with the title that my people give the first servant of the country. And this means managing is to be important. How do you provide food to the people? How do you make the market function? How do you create the investments? You know, we've been fortunate in ensuring that Australia's most famous billionaire is now committing to produce 20,000 megawatts of power and convert, and hopefully convert our iron into steel that would have zero carbon emission. Afghanistan could become a leader of the green energy. That requires a different type of imagination to work. But if we are confining ourselves and defining ourselves narrowly, that lead leadership means two things simultaneously. We need to have the ability to overcome the past. The Afghan people are not prisoners of the past. We want to live. The past is about dying, and we've died enough. We must live. We must embrace living. And in order to embrace living, we must have the discipline of building a future together. A future that every Afghan can identify with. And this means, in the weeks, in the days to come, we have to have the courage to declare a national ceasefire so that we can proceed to make peace politically, not under the barrel of the gun. I hope my uh, fellow citizens forgive me, but we have a proverb. You cannot persuade an Afghan, uh, sorry, you cannot force an Afghan to heaven, but you can persuade him to go to hell. The path of persuasion is the right path, lots of the courage, commitment, and compassion to make it and then build it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Thank you so much for this wonderful, inspirational uh, speech. I think you've, uh, masterful, mas in a masterful way, brought the realities of Afghanistan along with some of the theories that you've been advocating for a long time about the importance of the state, the importance of thinking long-term, 
sustainability, not to think short term, not to worry about just today and tomorrow, but to consider the next generation, which I think is it's absolutely critical. If you allow me, I have a couple of questions, and then we'll take maybe some it, questions from you. I'd like to start with, with the, sorry, there is some. It's a COVID effect. <laughs> Okay, Can I'd like to start with, the, with what you perceive as the main obstacles. You clearly are fully aware of the capacities, the capabilities, the potential that Afghanistan has. And a lot of it are capacities that have been identified some time ago. And they're not, they're not necessarily uh, a new. But why has it, for the last 19 years, not been able to be untapped? What were the main critical issues that has stopped Afghanistan from uh, exploiting uh, some of those resources? Is it just the war, or there are other things that you were? Well, thank you. Thank you for that excellent question. The first issue is that Afghanistan was always a short-term enterprise for the international community. People came and went. That continuity of, of a vision did not come. We are grateful. We are a very grateful nation. But the, Sorry. the horizon was always short term. Second, and this should not be taken in the wrong way, we were not focused on developing what was, and understanding what was under our noses. Aid came like a bonanza. And when a good is given to you free, you develop a sense of entitlement. Our expectations were raised without thinking through about the fundamentals. You know, before I became president uh, and uh, 14 years, we didn't complete a single dam. For 40 years, Afghanistan had not managed to complete a dam. And when the first dam, the Afghan India Friendship Dam in the Herat province in Salman the village was completed, there was national celebration. The discourse is changed now. That that discourse of self-reliance did not exist. Second, the regional perspective was lacking. You know, in the last five years, we've become an integrated part of Central Asia. After 120 years, or particularly after Stalin's brutal separation, we have now reunited. We've become trade partners. Our relationships are phenomenal. We developed air group. So the key is that we did not think this framework that I've offered you is very simple. But that was not the national discourse. Now, everything in Afghanistan, particularly in the provinces, capitals are funny places. Because you know they're self-reinforcing within a kilometer square. Uh, but in the provinces of Afghanistan, there's a transformation that, that is unbelievable. Men and women who come, articulate, who are able to debate. The freedoms took time. You know, 10 million of us have returned. Kabul is a miracle. It was 400,000, now it's close to five, five million. So the adjustments from the years, and the other part were frustrations. Hopes were too high, delivery was too low, and some fundamental issues of peace and war were not thought through. Now, fortunately, there's alignment with the international community, with the regional, and particularly within the country, that we need to look inside while looking outside and bring the two together. Thank you very much. The other important uh, aspect I think you've drawn our attention to is that peace cannot be exclusively amongst the elites. It's got to be at the, at the people's level. But critics who look at Afghanistan and see how the last couple of years been, been developing in terms of peace operations and so on, 
will quickly point out to the fact that maybe that is still there, that still the elites are the ones who are running the show or the children. Sometimes they talk about the second generation of the old elites coming up. What is it that you're recommending or maybe you're already doing to allow peace to go down to the level of the population? Are, are there forums, are there uh, civil society arrangements where people talk to each other at the province level? Have they reached any, any um, compromises? Are they willing to reach compromises that the elites are not willing to do? Well, first of all, if it were an elite show, you think that Vice President Sali and I would be the president and vice president of Afghanistan? My colleagues and I represent public discourse. Mm -hmm. It's the deepest sense of engagement with the people. And the discourse that we produce now has become the national discourse. Elite is a 10-year presence in government makes you into a permanent elite. And what's, the, what's the depth of this elite? And who made them an elite? We are not an elite society. We are a deeply egalitarian society. You know, our aristocracy was product of trade, long distance trade, because we controlled the route, trade route. It was not control of land. We don't have inherited leadership. Not in a single community in Afghanistan is leadership inherited, even within the same families. It's, it's competitive. So the youngest, the oldest, etc. cetera. It's, it's important to understand the society. Elite theories are transferred from stable societies like the UK. But again, Francis Fukuyama has done an excellent paper I don't know whether it's published, I read it in an unpublished form some years back. The original thing of the glorious revolution is not an elite theory. It failed multiple times because you got to that. So we, the people of Afghanistan, this is a republic. Any peace agreement is to be approved by a lawyer in the parliament of Afghanistan. And that's where public debate takes place. If you make an elite deal, it will be a prelude to another round of conflict. Because this elite, the past inherited with enormous respect to them, were unable to make peace among themselves. Mm. And with that experience in mind, we have to be able to reflect on the future. They are important, and they will endorse the peace. They must be inclusive, and we have been inclusive. But monopoly will not work in our country. We are too large for that, too insistent on our equality. And our tradition is egalitarian. You know, you know uh, tribes, you know, the sense of every person who comes to talk to me at least talks to me as, as an equal and a lot of time as my superior. The reason they talk to me as, as my superior is they think I don't know what they're living through. And I'm a student, constantly. And that's what holds us together. Without a democratic arrangement, the person who described us best is a man called Elphinstone. He was the first Englishman to write a book on us. It's called The Kingdom of Kabul. He wrote in 1809. He visited Shower at that time, our winter camp. And he said Afghanistan can either be a complete republic or a complete dictatorship. We have tried dictatorship. It must be a complete republic. And if I may go to, back to the issue of courage, because I think that is a very important observation about for peace, you need courage. You cannot have peace without demonstrating a degree of courage. And that's something that Your Excellency have demonstrated by taking some very hard decisions over the last two years or so, including you know, the release of prisoners and so on. What is it that you think, um, uh, what kind of courage do you expect the other side to show? What is it that they need to uh, recognize as, uh, uh, as an area where they must make compromises for things to work out? 
and you know, not necessarily particularly around your own vision that is that you presented wonderfully, but maybe something that is agreed upon collectively across the country. Well, the first thing is to acknowledge that they're dealing with other Afghans. With other Afghans? Absolutely. What unites us together? Hmm. We've emphasized courage is not to emphasize differences. Courage to emphasize a common future. Look, all polls show 75 to 85% approval of the Republic, 4 to 8% approval of the Emirate. The power of the Taliban is negative, but we acknowledge them as a factor of our life. And we say they constitute a reality of our country, and we must make peace. They need to acknowledge that there is the majority of the country. And without acknowledging this, we cannot not move forward. Because if it's keep repetition, they are dealing with the United States as they are dealing with the United States. We are not party to them. We noted that agreement. But the United States is a binding treaty with us, two binding treaties. The Strategic Partnership Agreement and the Bilateral Security Agreement. It also is a joint declaration with us. That is a separate issue. They must have the courage to acknowledge that we are one society. Zimmer, uh, next to Weber, probably the most prominent German thinker of that period, says conflict is a relationship. His work on conflict is still outstanding. This is a relationship, but it has to change to a different type of relationship. A relationship where instead of killing each other, we're going to acknowledge each other. And in acknowledging, then of course you have to be both principled and pragmatic. We have shown twice, in 2018 and again in 2020, that power is not everything to us. Yeah. If our, the elite of 1992, the jihadist elite, had that kind of patience, we would not have been engulfed in conflict. We accepted that a political solution uh, to a non-conflict uh, situation, it was manly. Now we are saying again, we are willing to have a political solution. A political solution means talking politically to each other to carve the way to the future. They must have the courage to accept that the people of Afghanistan will make the ultimate decision about their future. That's the type of courage we require. Yeah. And the rest, of course, is negotiated. You know, we've been traders for two and a half thousand years. We know how to negotiate <laughs> across the world. <laughs> and if I may, before I go to the audience here, ask you one delicate question to do with Islam, because yes. you framed it as one of the capitals. Absolutely. And uh, uh, you rightly say that the constitution of Afghanistan had Islam pretty much as a cornerstone and it's at the center of it. Uh, what is it that they're asking more for it? I mean, where would you draw the line in terms of the role of Islam in, in the state, in society? Look, what, is, what is the issue? For those of us who don't know the context very, very, no, the, the, the issue is not delicate, it's, it's central. You have to go back to Afghanistan of before Genghis Khan. This, is, this was one of the greatest centers of Islamic learning in the world. Yeah. The Abbasid civilization first developed in Mao in Herat. The man who conquered Mao for Mamun was a Herati, Tahir. He marched straight from Herat all the way to Baghdad and then put Mamun on the uh, uh, throne. The mother of Mamun was from Badghis, uh, a province in Afghanistan. That civilization, there were more madrasas and truly uh, networks of learning in Balkh than in Baghdad. Changes was a point of elimination of 800 years of marginalization. We need to understand Islam as a civilization. You know what I do? 
In 1985-86, I took leave of absence from Johns Hopkins. I studied the life of the Prophet for one year in Pakistani madrasas. I know what discourse they come from. The question is not being Islamic. The question is the type of discourse. The problem is Orientalism. Edward Said, again, God bless his memory, uh, is framed it. The issue was that a, a, a caricature of Islam was presented in the colonial context that some people who were marginalized embraced it then. We need to discover our roots. And we need to understand. You think that this great civilization was created by sort are by also by 100 years of translation. The Islam of the Abbasid period was self-confident. Show me another culture prior to the modern world that had 100 years of translation of the Greeks, the Persians, the Indians, the Chinese. Every known civilization was incorporated within the Islamic universe. You think Ibn Sina or Abu Rayhan Biruni or our Ibn Rush were, were products of some marginal thinking. The roots, our common roots, need to go back to. Our recent anti colonial enterprises are enormously respectful, and I have immense respect for them because these are people who are truly dedicated. But in 1859, in Punjab, the majority of the students in the madrasas in Punjab, and incidentally, Punjab was more literate than London, were Hindus. Because, yeah, absolutely. Because they had to master Persian. Persian had been the language of administration for 300 years, and the British kept it. This tradition of madrasa is not a caricature. It is deeply rooted. It's and as part of that, we need to think through how we avoid dichotomies of false modernism. Namely, the school and madras are in conflict. No, they are not. Is, is, is there a single president of the United States that does not attend church? No. You know, I pray five times a day and proudly. We need. There was a period, because of the height uh, of inferiority complex, that our educated head vis-a-vis -vis the West, that they abandoned everything, from clothes to habits to others. No, these habits are enduring. Now the question is not just confined to the Japanese experience. Everybody has shown that there is no relationship between modernity and culture. All cultures are capable of modernity, but the forms of modernity differ. And we are in a postmodern age that brings us all together. So we need to engage together. The narrow view that you know this is you enforce a size of a beard or you whip a woman and others does not have a place in our, our great civilization and great religion. Uh, what I want for women of Afghanistan is the wealth of Bibi Khadija, the wisdom in learning of Bibi Aisha, the capacity of Um Salma in Hudaiba, the courage of Zainab in Karbala. Let us debate. Let us go to Quran and, and Sunnah. We are Hanafis, most of us, and then Jafaris. Imam Abu Hanifa, you know, one of the greatest minds on earth, Imam Jafar. What? Let's debate it in those terms. Would they like a debate in terms of Islamic rules or, or their agreement with the United States? Which one takes preference? Thank you very much. Uh, we'll take a couple of questions, but before that, I, I can't but ask you this question. <laughs> <laughs> is that engagement that you talk, uh, talk about is it actually happening on the ground in Afghanistan? I mean, we don't know. At the, at yes, the level it of is. provinces, schools, oh, yes, universities, it is happening. That it is, is happening. Those debates are taking place? 
Yeah, uh, the vice president is fond of this, so I'll just, I'll just uh, cite you. On Saturday, we're in the province of Baktika. Yes. There's a province that 10 years ago wouldn't allow a women's school to be built in its center. We just had completed five, uh, 50 schools, a significant number of them girls' school, at the demand of the people, and 150 schools were being built. So the other thing, of course, was power. It's one of the few provinces that's not linked to power. We are creating a national grid. So they said, one of them said, when you, what's wrong with Pactica that it still doesn't have? I said, I've allocated the money. You know, uh, who's preventing it? The Taliban. And one of the elders got up and said, I have news for you. They're saying, tell the president, any large scale project that transforms the practica is welcome. There's another province. We're building a canal. It's going to one of our, the water was flowing to one of our neighbors, so we sent a young man, the only son incidentally from the presidency. And said, what do you think of this water flowing? He said, it's like blood flowing from my chest. Saying, what if we restore the canal? The canal has been dried up for decades now. They said, we'll guard it. And he said, what if, the, if, if your com uh, Talib commander tells you not to build it? He said, I'll shoot him. People want services. People want a different future. Why are the Taliban so concerned about not declaring a ceasefire? Because two years ago, they had to threaten their fighters uh, to, to go back and not socialize. My plea to the Taliban, don't be afraid of ceasefire. Nobody is going to wipe you out. Have confidence, have the courage to engage other Afghans. You are a factor for your life. The sad fact is $60 million a year can, can keep the conflict going. But you are depriving your society, yourselves, of trillions of dollars. Don't, you don't need to engage in drug production to be wealthy. There's so much legitimate wealth that we can produce together uh, that you wouldn't know how to accumulate. Thank you very much. Uh, one of the reasons why our institution is thriving here is because in Doha, I don't know if you know this, but uh, we have academic freedom. And the margins of, of uh, free speech in Qatar is much larger than of any course. other of our neighboring countries demonstrated by Al Jazeera, but also academically here. So if you allow us, we'll take a of couple of questions from the audience. Uh, please make it very uh, uh, concise and short, and the question only, not a statement. <laughs> so Good luck with that. <laughs> we'll try, I'll try. <laughs> please, who'd like to go first? Todd, who's just behind you. If you're going to ask in Arabic, we need the, the translation for His Excellency. If you have the, are you okay with Arabic? Yes. Yeah. Uh, should, I, should I wear this? If it helps, sure. yeah. I think it's better. Fakhamit Rais, Your Excellency, thank you very much for being with us today. And, and I am optimistic because of your optimism. I come from a country, thank you, Your Excellency, I am optimistic because of your optimism. I am from a country which uh, suffers similarly to Afghanistan. I am from Syria. You know there are also um, similar conditions. There is a problem in the Arab world called the uh, Arab Afghans. Now, you in Afghanistan, after the fact that some Afghanis have uh, taken part in the conflict, that one day you'll have a problem called uh, Af Syrian Afghanis or Syrians in Afghanistan. I wish I'm not compounding your problems and adding to your problems, but 
there are um, many groups from, uh, from Afghanistan that are brought by Iran to, to Syria. There are also uh, jihadi groups who are impacted by Syrians who are in Afghanistan. I think you know Syria. You studied in Lebanon, as far as I understand. Thank you. Uh, Your Excellency, uh, would you like to take yes. more than a question at, yes. at once? Yes, uh, because it's Syria specific. Yes. So, uh, may I? Yes, please. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, first of all, my deepest sympathy. I have very fond memories of Syria. I've traveled to your beautiful country, and of course, during my visit in Lebanon. I wrote a long piece on, on Syria in 2014. Uh, it's, it's published in London, uh, so to give you an indication. Uh, networks are our central problem. It's not that it's just Syrians in Afghanistan or Afghans in Syria. All the disenchanted are everywhere. The problem is that we have nationalized the sense of conflict while it should be regional and Arab Islamic in scope and cooperation. The Fatimian are, are going to be a problem for every place, as will be the, the Daesh three years ago, Dabiq, uh, the magazine named, because the sense of the day of doom is supposed to take the last battle, is supposed to take there, but also their sense of Khorasan, uh, asked all its followers to not to come to Syria, but go to Afghanistan. We are dealing with networks, and I think this is an issue, Dr. Barakat, for you and your colleagues, to think through the nature of the networks. Networks pose a completely different scope for conflict than previous civil wars or state-to-state -state conflict. And if we don't engage in Arab-Islamic cooperation, we are going to be sorry in the future. These problems are really genuine. And the difference between Al-Qaeda and Daesh if Al-Qaeda was version one, Daesh is version five of networks. And now Al-Qaeda is relearning from Daesh. The reason we want peace with Taliban is because with Taliban, as part of reintegrating Afghan society, we'll be able to isolate these much more larger networks. And particularly because they're simultaneously virtual, they're very dangerous. Thank you, thank you. Please, behind you. Yeah, right there at the back. Thank you, let me address you, Professor Ashraf. <laughs> I was honored to be a professor for Afghan for six years in Peshawar. Oh, I want to denote two, in brief, two points. The first, as a gratitude for two millions martyrs from Afghan defending their dignity and sovereignty. I hope that you can demand for compensations and recuperation from all the invaders who killed these two, two millions. You, ha you can demand for one trillion dollar as there are two million mines and there are displaced and see disabled and so the second you cannot depend only on technology you can depend about human beings these invincible countries you are controlling the country of lions afghans i was a professor for them and i don't know we made a lot of plans for development while i was the, the head of the scientific board so i'll, I'll contact his excellency the ambassador to tell him about all this plan thank you very much well, thank you. Thank you for your investment in Afghans. Thank you for describing us as a country of the lions. We take pride in friends like you, and together we will make history. Can you please pass the microphone to the guy in front? Yes. Assalamu uh, alaikum. Uh, Mr. President, uh, I am the first Afghan graduate uh, researcher from uh, Doha Institute, and I'm a proud student of Dr. Uh, Barakat. And my question is about uh, the uh, transitional justice. 
In post-conflict setting, international actors mainly concerned about the division and incoherence in the war-torn countries. And the international actors deny the transitional justice in Afghanistan, and it's still absent from the process. So will it will be part of the future setting of the peace process? Because if the past uh, remains unaddressed, the, it will continue the spirit of revenge. Plus, if God forbid, if the peace process is uh, getting failed, will there will be a real reintegration plan for the moderate Taliban to have a safe gateway to go there and reintegrate? Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for having enough one. The last one you produced is very distinguished. Minister Atmar was a, a student of uh, Dr. Barakat, so we have benefited enormously uh, from his uh, major contribution. We look very much similarly to a contribution from you uh, uh, and other Afghans who come to the Doha Institute. Our Jirga tradition is different than the Hammurabi tradition. The Hammurabi tradition is an eye for an eye, a hand for a hand. State justice is about punishment. Our Jirga tradition is about order. So it's extremely important to see what is it that we want for the future. Look at Spain. In 1975, after the death of General Franco, they decided to embrace the future. For nearly 30 years, they didn't talk about Franco. They built a democratic Spain. I interviewed every single one of the people who was alive in, in 2000. Uh, six or seven. Did France talk about its collaboration with the Vichy? Did Germany talk about its Nazism? Each of these are the major centers of democracy they built. We need to understand how we balance justice and order. Peace is going to require a sense of forgiveness. But that commitment to forgiveness, that's part of the courage, has to be based on no repetition. We have to enable to move forward. And again, part of this is going to be also dealing with the challenge of the black economy. The largest, 40 of the largest drug dealers in the world were released. None of them was arrested as, as a Taliban but we had to make the sacrifice for peace. Now we need to be able to integrate them. So that's the, exactly the type of challenge. Instead of giving you a categorical answer, I want to say that the criteria, again, will be the wisdom of the public. The Louis Jirga of Afghanistan, where parliament is going to be a very significant portion of it, are going to debate to see what really allows us to integrate. Are we postponing? We have a tradition, particularly in some of the, the provinces. We put a stone over a conflict, literally. 10 years, we say, in order to avoid a feud. We put a stone, for 10 years, it doesn't get discussed. Why? Because then the blood is no longer boiling. We allow uh, waste of coming. This is why I was saying, we have a cultural repertoire that is extremely rich in peacemaking. And peace is not just at the national level, dear uh, uh, fellow citizen. Level, the difficulty of peacemaking in different provinces and different sub-regions of the country is going to be different. Kandar, Helmand, Zabul, Uruzgan are probably going to be one of the most challenging, uh, while well, Lahman, uh, Ningrar, uh, Kunal in Nuristan are likely to be some of the easiest, the others fall into it. You have to align different sub-realities within the larger reality and frame it in a way that is both principled and yet pragmatic. 
in the other part, sorry. Uh, let's not talk about failing. We're determined to succeed. We're, um, we have a lot of questions, but they're all coming from men. I'm looking for a woman to ask a question before we give more opportunity for more men to ask. No? I would have thought by when His Excellency refers to tradition, you will also challenge him on tradition vis-a-vis -vis women. And if that is an issue that is no, I wouldn't. You know, look, the mother, the mother of two of our greatest leaders, Ahmad Shah Abdali's mother, then subsequently known as Durrani, was one of our most eminent poets and educators, the mother of Mirwais. We, we have had very, the part of the problem with tradition is that the history is written by men in 20th century. In 20th century, was sexes to the core. Because to be, to be very honest and, and uh, frank, when uh, talking to some of the Taliban, and you say to them, why would you restrict women in this way? Islam doesn't yes. allow you to do this, yes. in fact, especially Hanafi. Uh, of course. The answer we always get is, it's our tribal tradition. What tribal tradition? To show me where, how many Pashtun women were in Parda in 19th century or 18th century or, uh, or early 20th century. All our women, show me a single nomadic woman that embraced the beard. So this is a modern. It's their interpretation. This is the madrasas that, uh, that got them. Any Afghan that has grown in a household knows the power of the woman. Yes. My grandmother has been dead for 40 years. All the land is still referred to it as, as her land. <laughs> ask Fatima Gilani. Ask Fawzi Kuf. Ask uh, Amidi. Uh, ask the Wardaks. Dr. Surabi was, was governor of a province. Did a single uh, person come and said, you don't have the right to be governor? He said, they are misinterpreting with enormous respect to them. I've studied Afghan history 1,000 years. In the last 400 years, I spent 14 years studying. And because I wanted to look for women, I found them powerful, <laughs> articulate, educated, and among Pashtun women, all the rest of families, households that were on the trade route, their women were educated. The Taliban should understand our history. And if they dare, let, let, them, let right. them tell their wives what they're really thinking. Allow their wives to come and talk to, 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 to the other women and see how much common ground they will find. I don't know how. how, how you I think I have time. to take a plane. We have to, yes. I yes. Know. <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm afraid we'll uh, we won't take any more questions. I'm sorry because we have already overrun by almost half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But it's been uh, such a wonderful privilege to have your Excellency with us, and to have this uh, frank and open discussion. I hope. Please let us know if there's anything we can do to help, uh, both in, in an informal capacity, but most importantly as academic institutions, if there are well, ways in which me, we can link. Dr. Barakat, let me thank you. Let me thank the wonderful audience. Let me thank your colleagues, your students. Let me thank the government and the people of Qatar. What you're doing to host our wonderful delegation is incredible. Please engage with them. Please allow, arrange for informal gatherings, not just the formal ones. Uh, and please keep your research. And please recruit more Afghan students so they can ask significant, they can focus on the type of life transforming issues that you and your colleagues are dealing with. It. So it's really continue your work with full speed, and we will be the beneficiaries. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.